All right. Well, thanks for thanks for coming. I know uh, there was a lot of folks that came to the supply chain uh, session yesterday that also had some workforce issues, and so they may have gotten uh, a little of what what they were looking for yesterday. But um, uh, but today is going to get into down into the weeds a bit more. So uh, hopefully this will be provide you with a lot of really uh, tangible uh, tools and, and and knowledge about the types of of programs that are out there, but also some different ways of thinking about developing a pipeline of workers. Is that locked? Um, so I'm Ellen Kaler. I'm the <clears throat> executive director at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and <clears throat> our, our our panelists today. Uh, well, we, we started off with four panelists, and now we're down to two. But luckily, um, we have uh, all of their slides and a video. Uh, so we will, in essence, have two not here panelists, but their content will be here, and then two panelists who are here. Um, so Jason uh, Finley's with the Career Services Coordinator at the Randolph Tech Career Center in, in Randolph, and Molly Willard from the uh, Vermont Technical College um, had surgery this morning at 7.30, so that's why she's not here, but I will be uh, walking through her slides. And then Amanda Chase is the Director of Strategic Engagement at Advanced Vermont for her last day on the job, and then she goes to UVM Continuing Education. So thank you for being here instead of um, wrapping up at the office on your last day. And uh, J Jay Ramsey, unfortunately, couldn't be here. He is the new reg Director of Registered Apprenticeships at Vermont Department of Labor and for many years was the CTE coordinator um, at the, the Agency of Education. He's moved recently over to the department um, and uh, he unfortunately couldn't be here but he did pre-record uh, a video uh, of his slides and his talk so we will be showing that. So um, I wanted to just, uh, uh, this. so this is gonna be a little bit more of a traditional four presentations hold questions until the end, because I think the way that we've got this set up, there's a progression. Um, we're gonna start at sort of the high school level, we'll go to the associate's degree and college continuing education level, then we go to paid internships, uh, and then we go to registered apprenticeships. So there's a logic to this that I think then if we just hold questions to the end and you get to hear about all of these different types of, of, of um, workforce development, uh, ways of, of, of um, developing that pipeline and, and professional professionals that you need in your in your um, businesses that um, a lot of that will get answered and then we can have a good robust uh, Q&A session at the end okay so take be sure to take some notes um, and then at the at towards the very end uh, Charlie Shackleton and Kate Zeem you're Kate hi Kate um, uh, we uh, well, from the Vermont Woodworks Council, uh, I think some of you may have heard they recently were um, awarded a congressionally directed award from Senator Leahy, so they have some money coming uh, to do workforce support training, something related to workforce in the industry, and they're trying to figure out what. And so we're going to use all of you to provide some input and ideas about what they could do with the money that they're getting to support workforce development in the, in the sector, okay? So uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to do a little brainstorming around that. So I thought it would be helpful to just um, mention a couple of things. Um, for those that were in my session yesterday, I went over this, uh, but for those who weren't, I, I think it's really important context setting uh, to, to lead into this panel, um, which is that and this is all official data from the Department of Labor and their uh, Employment and Labor Market Information Division. There are approximately 28,000 job openings in Vermont as of December 21. Now that probably is a little bit less now because jobs have been filled uh, over the last five, six months uh, more so, but still it represents a very large number of job openings. And the number of Vermonters available to fill those jobs uh, as of January of this year was 9,945. So this is a structural change to our labor market work and labor workforce. There are not enough people 
here in Vermont to fill the jobs that exist today, let alone the number of people who will be retiring uh, and, the, and the job growth that might be happening from companies who are trying to expand to take advantage of new market opportunities. So we have a structural uh, challenge ahead of us. It's really, I think it's probably the first time since World War II, <laughs> really. We always used to have sort of enough, and as employers, you probably through word of mouth. I mean, there might have been some skills mismatch um, in terms of the types of jobs versus what people were looking for. But generally speaking, there were more people looking for work than there were jobs often. Um, and so we have a very different situation now, and that requires employers to think differently about talent attraction, <laughs> recruitment, talent ret retention, uh, professional development and career pathways within your firms, because without that, um, it's a very expensive proposition to lose a valued employee. And people are moving around a lot these days. So um, we're hoping that through this panel, you'll get some ideas about things that you can do. Um, because, uh, and, and it's also the case that the, still because of COVID with childcare issues, with struggling to find adequate housing, with transportation issues, the workforce precipitation rate has uh, fallen from 66% to 60%. So there still is like all these folks that are just, some of, there, there are some people still sitting on the sidelines, so to speak, and are not, have not re-entered the workforce. But uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that we are in a, in a very different uh, workforce and labor uh, participation environment than we've been in for a very, very, very long time. Um, the other thing that's a new piece of data that came uh, to surface during the course of the last legislative session that, that Representative Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro stumbled upon was this, situ this, this number of 200,000 ununique individuals who are, uh, there's, a, there's a job event Right, so you think about the number of people that are leaving a job, that's, that's one job event, somebody leaves a current location, then they get hired by somebody else, that's another job event. So you could say, even still, there's 100,000 job events happening over the course of a year in the state of Vermont across all employers. So the competition for workers, um, and especially skilled workers, um, is very high. And so as an employer, thinking about new strategies and maybe things that you've never had to deal with before um, is something that's, that I would just really encourage you to start putting some, some attention to because it's not uh, getting better. Uh, and, and so we have a lot of forces that are impacting uh, the, 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 why this is the case here in Vermont um, from U.S. immigration laws that have really reduced the inflow of potential workers from baby boomers who are retiring, um, both as workers but also as business owners. So we have a big succession wave coming up in the next 10 years and a lot of business owners that have had a company for 30, 40, 50 years who don't have that next generation to naturally take over and trying to figure out what do I do? I, I heard from the folks at Vermont uh, Employee Ownership Center who had their big conference yesterday, their annual conference, that the number of, of employers reaching out to them to learn more about employee ownership transition has never been higher. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going on. Um, you have um, a lack of awareness amongst parents, students, parents, and guidance counselors about all the different types of jobs that exist in the work in the forest products industry and that the uh we just put put out and will be soon really releasing more widely the vermont forest uh, economy career guide as a way of being able to to showcase all the different types of jobs that are actually in the industry um, we'll be getting that to all the cte centers and to the high schools guidance counselors and circulating it widely uh, so that young people can learn more about it um, and so it's, it's just really uh, important that we start thinking about things like where do we advertise for jobs beyond just word of mouth? How do we onboard people well? How do we improve our workplace culture so that you bring somebody in that you're really excited about, but the, the, the workplace environment is so toxic they just don't, they don't stay? You know, how do we have more diversity in the workplace? This industry has been primarily a male-dominated industry, but 
half of the workforce is, are women. So how do you, you le basically have a, a half the workforce available to you that is just not showing up because of some workplace culture issues that are something that could be addressed. Um, and then there's the, the advancement and the retention strategies that are really important to be looking at also. Um, I will say that um, this was a big issue during the legislative session. S11 was just signed two days ago into law by the governor. It was something that was worked on by a lot of people. It's the, both the workforce and, and economic development bill, the, the big one that moved this session. There are a number of um, topics, a number of, of workforce related initiatives in that bill, uh, including uh, a lot of work to try to uh, reach into those uh, individuals who've been perhaps incarcerated in the past um, and finding ways to support them to get back into the workforce so that they don't reoffend. Um, that may be an area for some of you to think about uh, and what would need to be in place on, in your businesses to support those individuals to be uh, working for you. Um, the Department of Labor is going to be putting together a statewide platform. I think that's going to be a couple of years in the making, right, in advance Vermont's in on that as well. Is that true? Um, We're in support. In support. Um, to try to have, have more of a, of a one-place portal. Uh, Advanced Vermont also has a phenomenal uh, website called My VT, My, no, Future My Future VT, um, that has a lot for young people. It's really geared towards people that are looking for, for jobs um, and looking for educational um, uh, offerings and how to sort of be on a career path. Um, there's a number of provisions, finally, around career and tech education centers, including a lot of dollars for infrastructure and improvement of the facilities. Uh, going on. The Burlington Sex Center, for instance, is being completely rebuilt, a $35 million project in the Burlington area. Um, there's going to be a Vermont Trade Scholarship Program so that if there are people that you want to hire, but they, and, and they may not know about this yet, I mean, there needs to be a lot of outreach on this, um, that, you know, have a, have a professional degree in some form of the trades, there's going to be money through VSAC to have some of that loans forgiven. So that's another big one to make, to lower the hurdle to be able to take the jobs that are here. Um, and many, many others. So if you're interested at all, um, check out uh, S11 uh, and, and see what's in there. And just at, so you know, all of these slides, um, we have a lot of notes embedded in these slides in the notes section, and we're going to turn it into a PDF and make it available to everybody. So you don't need to scramble to take a lot of notes um, because we'll have it. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this career guide is something that we're, we're hoping are, is going to advance knowledge uh, about the industry. And uh, once we get the URL really out there, we're hoping that you all can spread the word because we need to be motivating and inspiring young people to be getting involved in the industry. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, um, and he's going to talk about CTEs. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I brought my notes because I could probably spend an hour on each of these slides I have here, so I'm trying to condense it to about a minute apiece. <clears throat> um, one thing I really like the way that actually this is set up today because it, it kind of falls in line in how I do my work. So when you think about what a career development coordinator does, or you might hear it called a co-op coordinator or a work-based learning coordinator at your te local tech center, we all have them. Um, what our work used to be a number of years ago was a kid would come to us and say, hey, can I get a job? And it would be my job to get them a job. That's really changed. And the, sh the shift has gone to it's now a spectrum. We're helping students with a spectrum of career development. So everything from helping them create resumes, um, how to interview well, bringing in outside partners for mock interviews, uh, doing career exploration, informational interviews, job shadows, site visits, going out and hopefully do unpaid internship, paid internship, right? So that whole spectrum of career development. It's not about just finding the kid a job anymore. It's about helping prepare them, provide them information, give them the skills they need to make a good decision on what that next step is. Um, and I do this through partnering with employers um, in many ways. And, and part of that, someone mentioned um, building conversations. So one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit here is how do you build those conversations with students and keep, continue to build on those. And also, I think it's important um, building relationships with students that you hope to hire in the future. Because um, do I just do the down arrow? Yeah, just the down arrow. 
Okay. Because this is an important piece of data here. Um, this is the time of year, May and June, that I get phone calls all day, every day from employers saying, do you have somebody that has these skills? And I say, I do, but they're already out on co-op and that's going to transition now into either summer employment before they head off to school or they're hired on full time and the day after graduation they're going to work. Um, and they always hang up. And then next year, the same employers call me back. Hey, do you have any? And so this is the time of year um, I'm fielding a lot of those calls. I'm not fielding them from employers that students have already developed relationships with. And one thing I want to point out is it doesn't take a lot of time and energy on employers' um, half to figure out how to start to develop those connections with students. So what this shows here is they surveyed young adults and they asked them what the most impactful way was, most meaningful way was to think about careers in college. And they said career talks, right? Simply come, having folks come in and talk to them about career pathways, not just once or twice, but multiple times over the time they were in school. Unfortunately, it's also the least utilized, right? 13%. Um, so that's the way that they did that. It's also the least utilized um, way that we connect with students and employers out there. And ironically, it's like the least labor intensive on the employer's end. The least time like, that you have to put into something for a, this great outcome. Um, and so what does that look like? So an example is Upper Valley Honda. So I'm down the Upper Valley, kind of White River Valley region. They came in a couple months ago for a guest speaker event, talked to students, spent about a half hour with some of our kids. Two of our seniors said, hey, can we do a site visit? They were invited down for the site visit. One of those seniors is now on co-op there and is gonna work there going forward full time. Another senior decided to go a different direction, but 50%, not bad. Three juniors went down for last week for a tour. They, two of them came back. They already have plans to co-op there next year. So all in all, three experiences that that employer had with our students, about three hours of their time and three hires. That's not a bad return on your investment of time and energy. But does it take time to come in and do that things and take time from your day when they come in and visit your site? Yes, it does. Three hires for three hours worth of, of energy. Um, another organization that we've worked with is um, Chippers. So they came in to, with guest speakers because of COVID, right? We couldn't have them in the building. So they came in and they did a number of outside activities with our students last year, did some demonstrations, um, did some training with us. They had them come down the White River, or not White River, um, Woodstock this year to their facility there, showed these students around. We have seven students in our diversified ag program, which houses all of our forestry environmental resource management piece. Of our seven students, Four went down there and they're all hired and they're all working. I put them on co-op uh, last week and they started. Th today, this week they're there four days. Next week they'll be graduating after that full time, right? And you can see that these students have game of logging one, two, three, and four, OSHA 10, UVM tractor safety, um, BLS for the professional rescuer, like they had wood miser training, welding experience, fruit tree pruning, grafting experience, sugaring experience. These are gonna be good hires, right? because they put the time in to come in to the center, work with us, develop the relationships. Um, and that's important. And so I wanna say one thing here too, what's important about this is not only does it provide students exposure to you, you have exposure to students. So you're taking notes. Boy, this Jacoby guy, every time I come out, he's always here early, he stays to help cleans up, he's the first one to ask a question, he's gonna be my radar screen, right? So it gives you a sense of kind of like, what these students are like. And so when they come to your site visit and you start talking about job offers, you know Jacoby's gonna be one of your guys. And Sam, who kind of sat in the back, showed up late, left early, maybe not Sam, right? That, but the resumes might be exactly the same, but you have a better sense of them because you've spent time with them developing these relationships. So that's really an important piece. Again, this continuum of engagement, this continuum of building um, relationships with people. So this is one thing that as a center we've um, really focused on. These are some pre-COVID numbers. We had an outside accreditation uh, organization come in and evaluate us. This is some of my data that they did about me. Um, and so this is important. As a career center, do we provide information about jobs and careers that will be in high demand? 99% of our students say yes, right? Because we focus so heavily on guest speakers. 
Unfortunately, because of COVID, this has fallen to the wayside. So next year, we're gonna be looking to redevelop these opportunities. And we're gonna be looking for partners again to come in and do these things. So this is the time to hopefully get back in the tech centers, get back in the high schools and do some of these things. All tech centers do this, uh, we, not maybe as heavily as Randolph Tech, but this is an opportunity to get your foot in the door next year. Now, hopefully the COVID restrictions are removed and, and talk to our students and, and develop these long-term um, relationships. And so also talk about your return on investment. Again, um, all these things do take time. Now I understand that um, and it costs you money, right? So you're, if, you're, if you're talking to students, you're not making money, right? So that's exponential cost to you. But this is important. Basically what this data shows is SHRM, Society of Human Resource Management Professionals, found that people who hire interns, those interns are more likely to be there five years from now than this person that you hire off the street will be next year. Right, so that, if you know how much time, energy, and money you spent on hiring and recruiting, that is money in the bank for you. Five years from now, your intern is more likely to be here than this person you hired off the street. It's close, but I mean, that's, that's a huge return on your investment of time and energy into these students. Um, and again, this goes both ways. Um, something that I could talk days about is lifestyle and gamification. And when you're talking about recruiting students and bringing them in, so I'm old and gray, so I want to hear about your 401k plan and your insurance benefits and all that piece, right? They want to hear about how your career fits into their lifestyle. So when you're talking to them, talk about how like, you could be outdoors every day or this is how it looks at this time of the year. Oh, you're a hunter, you're like turkey hunting? Yeah, we can make allowances for some of our staff, right? Or we shut down these two weeks since so we all go to Ohio and hunt. Let them know how it fits into their lifestyle because that is important. That's what they want to hear. Um, and that's what they want to know more so than the 401k matching, which is you know, that kind of stuff is important, but not when you're 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, so I had an example of that as I had a student who had no desire from our diesel program to work for the state. I shared with him, did you know the local garage, they go to four tens every, every week during the summer. So they have every week you have a three day weekend. He's like, oh, how do I do a job shuttle there? It took that to change his mind about saying, I'm not gonna work for the state to like, oh, that might be all right. So think about how that fits into his lifestyle. How do you do what you do in ways that might entice um, students? Or share those things that you already do that like, excite kids to fit into your lifestyle. Um, again, and again, gamification. So all students are like this now on phones, playing video games. They like these instant rewards, right? They wanna know how is this gonna be beneficial to me tomorrow, right now if I do this thing. So set out these clear expectations for them. You don't have to hire them in at $22 an hour, right? You can hire them at 18, but you show them the path to 22. Listen, if you get your OSHA 10, I'm gonna give you 50 cents more an hour. If you get game of logging three or four, that's worth an extra dollar an hour. You show up every day on time for the first 30 days, I'm gonna give you an extra 50 cents an hour. They like that. They like to see um, the relevance of what they do and how that works out. They like to see that there's, they're being rewarded for the merit of the effort they put in, right? So for who they are. And my students, I teach them, for every dollar an hour more you earn, that's 2,000 a year. Like, oh, so if I learn how to cut stairs, that's an extra dollar an hour, usually, right? So that's 2,000 more a year if I just learn how to cut stairs. Like, yeah, they put the time and energy into learning how to cut those stair treads because they know it's gonna be an extra two grand for the rest of their life, right? That's gonna be exponential. So we work on that. So kind of think about how you can gamify and set really clear goals and expectations for these students because they like to be recognized and rewarded all the time. Think about all the little dings in your phone. There's a reason why that works so well, right? Instant gratification. Think about how you can provide these like instant gratifications to your students or future employees. This is one thing I saw um, that really excited me um, about the Forest, Degree, the Forest Academy Career Guide. It's awesome. Um, I've already showed it to our ag instructor, again, who teaches forestry. The gender equity and diversity in there. Um, and you're right. We're missing half the talent pool if we're not tapping into that. So how do you do that? Vermont Works for Women is an organization that I work with a lot. And so they have different workshops and events through Women Can Do. They have trailblazer workshops that expose uh, young women to these opportunities where they come in and they're running chainsaws. They're working, you know, they're making tables. They're doing things with wood products, right? But are they doing it enough? And are you involved? They're a great organization to connect into. And also they do training 
for your current staff because sometimes there's these certain mental models among staff members um, about how can you reduce um, harassment in the workplace, right? So they can work with you and your staff and organization in a number of ways, from recruiting to retention. Um, again, reach out to them. They'd be more than happy to work with you. Um, another key point I want to talk about is uh, child labor laws. And this is where I get a lot of hands thrown up in there, like, well, it's great, Finley, but we can't hire them until they're 18. That's not true. So working with career and technical education centers, Department of Labor has what's called student learner exemptions. And many of these fields and industries rely on me to help you figure out how to navigate that. Um, that's literally my job, right? Is to help put students into the workplace. So I, this is the water I swim in. And so going back to chippers, those four students they hired, one of them is 17. He is doing everything all three 18 year olds are doing, right? Can he run a chainsaw? Yes. If he was from a high school, no. If he's from our auto program, no. But since he's from our diversified ag program that includes forestry in their training, they can run chainsaws, they can use a chipper, they could do some of these things that a typical 18 year old can't do as a 16 or 17 year old. I can help navigate a bunch of those. Some of, some of the things um, that we see in hazardous occupations, yes, they have to be more closely supervised, but it doesn't mean you have to be standing over their shoulders or there's time limited. But again, that student's doing everything that his peers who are 18 years old are doing. Um, and if they come through a tech center program, Department of Labor says, even if they're 17, they're 18 the day they graduate. Again, I can help navigate that. That's literally my job, is to essentially be um, your human resource department, especially for some of you smaller organizations. How do you find the talent that you want that has the technical skills, the employability skills, and how do we navigate child labor laws in order to to get these, these folks you know, working for you. Um, so the key points I want to share is you got to get into schools. you got to develop relationships. It's not going to happen if you call me in May or June. Those students are already gone because they already know somebody that they met two or three times their junior year and two or three times their senior year, and now they're working for them. Um, so get into schools to talk about lifestyle, help students see the pathway going forward, right? Like map this out for them. They want to know. Like they, they, some people call it the why generation. Well, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Help them figure out that pathway going forward. Um, and expand your talent pools. Start looking at you know, people that don't look like me. Um, there's another organization that just put a bunch of awesome playing cards. Almost to recruit in their industry. Everyone looks like me. They're all like, well, normally, like, and flannels, the beard, right? It's like, okay, but what about everybody else that you're excluding because they don't see somebody when they pick up this card and think about their future? Like, I don't see anybody in any of these fields that looks like me. So think about how you go out and recruit some of these other talent fields, uh, some of these other talent fields. Great. All right. Right. Thank you, Jason. All right. So next up is Vermont Tech's uh, degree program. And uh, for those of you who came in a little bit late, Molly Willard was supposed to be here to do this. These are her slides. I do not work for Vermont Tech. I do some projects with Vermont Tech, but I so if there's a lot of detailed questions, I'm not going to be able to answer them. But Lisa Henderson from VMAC is in the room and she might be able to when we get to the oh, Q&A. Yeah. Or, or we'll find we'll find out and follow up. So, um, but uh, what if Molly was here and was right, right here at this podium? What she would be saying to you is um, that uh, at Vermont Tech they do have a number of degree programs uh, for 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 the forest products industry. It's a relatively new program, but it's been gaining ground steadily. There are still um, uh, spots open, uh, opportunities for young people to to uh, get into the program for this fall. So if you know of a young person that still hasn't decided what they're doing and might be interested in, in, in getting involved uh, in this degree program, it's not too late for the fall. So you can see here what the different types of degree programs are that are offered at Vermont Tech that has something to do with this industry. Um, so and a few facts about Vermont Tech, they have traditionally served Vermonters. 85% of the students uh, come from Vermont. 
and they have about a 99 to 100 percent uh, placement job placement rate and they're ranked number one in uh, in Vermont for a return on investment for your educational dollars uh, all the programs are very hands-on they are really applied uh, so they really um, for those types of students that really learn best by doing Vermont Tech is an excellent uh, opportunity for them to get an education um, they really uh, work hard to think to talk with a lot of employers and design their programs uh, to educate the workforce of, uh, in Vermont. Um, their programs are really integral to, to building vibrant, innovative rural communities. Um, Vermont Tech itself is located in Randolph Center, so it's in a very rural area to begin with. Um, and they've trained many generations of Vermont dairy farmers um, and, and many others. Um, there's a lot of changes that are happening um, at Vermont Tech with the consolidation of the state college system. The Vermont campus is staying where it is, not going anywhere, um, and it's going to be really dialed in even more on that applied workforce learning because the rest of the state college system is less applied and less hands-on. So it's really, if you want a technical education, this is really where you should be going. Um, so. We, they started offering uh, this uh, associ Applied Associates degree in forestry in 2017, uh, and it was created actually in collaboration with the Rubenstein School uh, at UVM um, so that there were students, um, so that their students could matriculate onto UVM to get a four-year bachelor's in forestry at UVM. So you can go two years at Vermont Tech, and then you can matriculate to UVM and get uh, a bachelor's than from UVM. So uh, these collaborative stackable degree programs are important for filling a variety of workforce needs from forest technicians to trained loggers and professional foresters. The program at Vermont Tech gives students unique opportunities in part due to some of the other degree programs and, and their courses and their course offerings. So students have access to courses and trainings to develop skills needed in the forest products um, industry but also have uh, opportunities in, in others so for instance um, uh, they can come to Vermont Tech for a forestry knowing that they'll then be running uh, they might be having an idea in their mind that they're gonna want to run a, uh, a logging or land management business um, and so they can have access to taking business courses and entrepreneurship courses and they can also take classes in hydraulics and welding and diesel mechanics courses. Um, all of these are really important skills that are needed to run a successful logging and land management um, business. So in addition to Vermont, uh, in addition Vermont Tech has degree programs that align with skills needed to work in the wood product sector offering uh, around uh, that are related to say electrical engineering or construction management or manufacturing. Um, there are also uh, programs that allow f uh, students to access courses using CNC machines, computer programming for machines, and electrical skills that um, to troubleshoot and maintain equipment. Uh, they also have a 250-acre uh, working forest land um, and, with, and they're able to get hands-on skills training in maple production, felling of trees, forest management and milling so the I think I pretty much covered up most of this here so um, so you can just you can check out more of their on their website in terms of the types of, of courses um, that are that are offered um, uh, and you know they also do stuff like soil and carbon sequestration, water quality, wildlife habitat, um, quality crop trees. Really, a, a very broad uh, selection of courses that that students um, can uh, take advantage of. Upon um, so let's see, we offer various forestry courses for dual enrollment credit, such as our burls to boards course where students learn the principles of tree harvesting for wood product production. Topics include choosing cutting, skidding, and milling, common types of lumber in Vermont. Upon completion, the, the student can manage small woodlots for efficient personal production of lumber products, uh, 
CTE centers and dual enrollment uh, collaboration allows students to receive high school or receive college credit while they're actually still in high school. Um, and the VAST program um, helps uh, seniors complete uh, in their in their senior year. They're actually getting uh, Vermont Tech uh, credit for for their courses. So there's a lot of opportunities for young people um, to get uh, to learn more about the how to get in. Um, they also collaborate with uh, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, training high school gap year and college students with workforce ready skills. Um, they uh, recently, or a couple years ago now, received an NBRC grant where in collaboration with UVM, UNH, and VYCC, they're offering forestry work crews. Um, participants in the forestry work crews are part of a highly trained workforce to accomplish forest tending management activities using timber stand improvement to support forest health in the forest products industry. Participants become skilled in timber stand improvement forest uh, to be a, a timber stand improvement forest technician and credits uh, for participants who complete the VYCC forestry groups um, receive credit to the Vermont, uh, Vermont Tech forestry program. The other thing, uh, so let's just say that you have existing workers uh, that need some additional training. You're bringing on a new machine or something like that. As an employer, you can reach out to Vermont Tech's a continuing education and workforce development system and explore whether there are some sp specialized trainings that they can offer. Um, these could be continuing education units, these could be um, other kinds of credentials or certificates. Um, and so uh, they are a nationally recognized, uh, they, they, they offer nationally recognized credentials for specific skills needed to support the forest products industry, including business development offering trainings in how to effectively manage and motivate workers, electrical apprenticeships, state certified, which is a state certified program, human resource development training, uh, which includes training and certificates, manufacturing apprenticeships uh, in advanced manufacturing, industrial maintenance, certifications in CNC machining, diesel technology certificates, welding training, wetland delineation certif uh, certificates, and soil trainings and Molly says, and much more. <laughs> um, so they, they really are uh, very flexible and they can tailor the trainings to your needs. Um, so if you're um, uh, a small business, but they're, they tend to, to be able to set up these partnerships where they do these trainings with employers that have a lot of, of employees, so that they might have 10 or 12 employees going through a training at the same time, but if, 10 or so employers came together and said, I have, I need, you know, two CNC uh, jobs coming open, and you can find a few other employers that have a similar need, then you could come together to, to, and work with uh, Vermont Tech to then be able to offer that to existing employees to improve their skills and get basically uh, sort of credentials in essence or just further training uh, in say CNC as a for instance so um, and and oftentimes what happens is that the your your um, employees are, are getting paid and working while they're also learning so they're getting that credential which is and those credentials can be stackable so that if they haven't gotten say a, an associate's degree yet they can be taking these types of classes and being able to work up to getting an associate's degree I'm hoping I'm saying all this right uh, Amanda because this is not my slide deck. Um, <laughs> um, so here at, um, well, well, no, here at, uh, at Vermont Tech, participants and forestry students uh, in their introduction to tree pruning and knots for ascension, ascension climbing uh, are learning how to scale trees. On the first day, students learn about tree pruning, growth, and health. On the second and third, they learn about friction hitches for ascending a tree for spurless uh, climbing. They learn the double rope techniques. And at the end of this training, they earn a certificate to share with potential employers. So training of employees is time consuming, and as we all know. And so aligning with a program where students have taken a specific course and training shows uh, interest and dedication and helps ultimately with retention. 
a program with the opportunity to increase skills and knowledge supports employee interest and, and their attention at your uh, business. So they're currently working uh, with Department of Labor, what's ISA? Some kind of... Yes, probably that. Uh, and employer partners to create a certified arborist apprenticeship. So um, they're becoming engaged uh, with em various employer partners uh, and uh, looking forward to exploring those opportunities with you if that is of interest. So um, what can you do and how, you can, how can Vermont Tech help you? Um, so uh, we'll have in the slides Molly's email address um, to get, um, so you can reach out to her post-surgery. <laughs> um, but they can develop trainings to meet your business, a cooperative uh, of businesses and industry needs. They can host class field trips for their forestry program. Um, you could be a, a guest speaker uh, in their program. Um, they s often set up career fairs, so you could have a table and, and, and um, look for students that way. Um, they have a jobs board, so you could post positions that they might have on that jobs board. Um, they, w if you send job openings to Molly, she can share that with other faculty and staff, uh, as well as students, to see if who knows anybody that might be interested. Um, and uh, you know she'd be really interested in working with you um, to, to be a, an apprenticeship site uh, if that's of interest um, and then they off uh, there's an offer of, of paid summer internships for Vermont Tech students that could lead to employment when they've graduated um, and as I meant we already walked through the employer partner program that they run so lots of opportunities to engage with Vermont Tech I think it's a it's a gem of a program that is often um, not really well known, uh, as well known as one would think it would be, given how good it is and how the students that come out of the program are just, they're just excellent. Um, and if you ever get a chance to be on campus and you go to some of their, their facilities, like their advanced manufacturing lab and, and some of the, and their wood shops and stuff, it, I mean, it's, it's really high class. So I'm going to end there and let Amanda come on up and talk a little bit about internship best practices. Thank you for your patience as I come through. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I'm Amanda Chase. I work at Advanced Vermont. I previously worked at the University of Vermont Career Center where I focused on internships and before that was a school counselor, so I come here wearing a few different hats. And in my, my current role, I'm also for, focused on working with students and adults who are interested in pursuing um, post high school types of education, whether that is um, apprenticeships or college or other types, of, uh, other types of education, and also thinking about next steps for their careers. So I am approaching this a little bit more focused on college students, but um, can also generally talk about internships as well. Um, so just quickly, when we're talking about internships, this is the on-the-job uh, experience that helps complement whatever a student is learning within the classroom. And what sets internships apart from, let's say, like volunteering or other types of uh, work is that it has some intentional reflection built into the experience and has some established learning goals that you all as the employers help create with the students. So they might go into their internship and say, by the end of this experience, I want to know how to do X, Y, Z. And at, as the employer, you can say, that sounds great. That aligns with what you would do in this role too. Internships also typically align with the college academic calendar, although there's some definitely some wiggle room with that, but they're often summer or a fall experience or a spring experience. So from your perspective as the employers, there are a lot of benefits to hosting interns. And Jason touched on some of this, and Molly had some of this in her slides as well, but you definitely learn, uh, you, you get a huge, um, open pipeline by bringing students on as interns and you really get to test drive those students as your future employees. You get to mentor the next generation of people coming into your business. Um, you get to find people with specialized skills and experience, a lot more ideas and energy coming in from young people. 
There's also this great stat I had found from the Society of Human Resource Management that for every student, and Jason had, I think, a similar one, that for every student you hire from intern to an employee, you save about $6,200. That stat is at least five years old, so I'm sure that's only gone up over time. But you get you know, this, this pipeline and the momentum of students are learning about your experience, they talk to their friends, so you have more students on college campuses who are familiar with you, they might seek you out, and you have more folks who, who can work for you. So let me make sure I touched on all the benefits there. Also a ton of benefits for students as well. So um, there's also the pieces that Jason mentioned about more persistence in your organization. People who have interned also tend to be more engaged employees over time. They're happier, they're more likely to stay, they are just benefits upon benefits there. So um, I like to think about prepping for an intern. If you're, if you're thinking about doing this, um, and we're gonna send, we have a, a printed guide that has all of this information in it as well. Um, when I start to think about internships, I always think about what might be on your, your wish list. Like if you had a second you working at your organization, what would that person be working on? Like, you know, um, those are things like maybe a research project or an assessment, an audit of how things are going, um, helping to, to keep track of inventory, doing a survey, uh, rolling out a marketing tool. You have a lot of different options. And so you might think about these, you could have a, a kind of themed intern or you could just have a general intern working for you. So you might have a marketing person or an, you know, someone focused as an arborist or it could just be general intern as well. Um, you know, it's helpful to think about the necessary qualifications that you're looking for in an intern and keeping in mind that the more wide open you keep these qualifications, the more folks you have who will be eligible for the position. So if you say, I need a senior with this specific major and these skills and they have to be in this location, you're going to narrow it down really narrowly. And so, you know, it's best to say, we want someone with an interest in this who has this, um, uh, this kind of interest in, and these skills. Keeping it broad is better. Um, for internships, it's best if uh, students spend no more than about 20% of their time on clerical uh, clerical work, so making, making copies or data entry and things like that. We all do some of that as our work. Like, I make coffee and I make copies. It just shouldn't be the only thing that they're doing. They need to have, you know, broader learning experience, too. Um, thinking about what the student needs to succeed is really important. I think this is something that often doesn't come up until the student has arrived, and I think you need to be intentional about planning this out. Like, where are they physically going to work? What kind of equipment do they need? Do they need a company email address to operate? Um, who is going to be their point person for supervision and training and orientation? How are we going to check in with this person, hopefully on a, on a weekly basis, to say, this is what's going well, these are the things you need to work on. And planning out in advance, like how, how you're going to have those check-ins and how will the intern know if they're successful in this experience. Having them participate in things like staff meetings, even if you have a conference call or working with a client, if you have lunches for your company, these all help people understand what the company culture is like. And even though we tend to think of those things as just kind of run of the mill experiences, they're really helpful for students to get an understanding of what it's like to work for your organization. So it's really helpful to include them on that. If they are only gonna work for you, maybe let's say Tuesdays and Thursdays each week, or um, you know, it might be, or if they, I should say, if they're planning on working for you two days a week, maybe choose the days that you have your staff meetings or trainings and things like that so they get to, to see what it's like. Um, it's really helpful to think about the crucial points of, uh, of working for your organization. That's everything from dress code to your workplace expectations, the, the specific responsibilities that they're gonna have in their role, and being as clear as possible about the expectations you have for them in their work. Jason touched on issues of access and equity before, but thinking about how do you widen this pipeline as best as possible to include people from all different backgrounds. So thinking about um, 
we had we had talked on a prep call before this about how can you also get in touch with organizations who are helping to widen that pipeline, like Voc Rehab, who has recently retitled their organization to Higher Ability, um, working with New Americans and refugees throughout the state of Vermont, working with women, recruiting people who may have been incarcerated in the past. But if we're really hurting for employees, like it, we really have to widen our our thoughts on who will be eligible for for these positions and helping these people, helping folks feel welcome and helping them get what they need to succeed in their jobs. And so there are a ton of organizations out there who can help you think about this and help, help you recruit and retain people in a helpful way. As we're thinking about internships, so it is possible to have interns who are unpaid or who are paid less than minimum wage. There are some nitty gritty considerations that are in the packet that Ellen just handed around that you have to consider. It is best for you and the intern if the experience is a paid one. Um, if you think about it, I did a bunch of research uh, at UVM on, on internships, and when you think about who has the luxury of working for free, again, it means that you're really narrowing this down to the students who, uh, who are already um, well enough off where they don't have to worry about making money for their experience. And so if you really want to bring in the widest possible array of people, you really should be offering uh, compensation for these experiences. If they are not paid experiences, they do have to be a really solid learning opportunity in order to abide by the regulations from the Department of Labor. And so that's, um, I would recommend taking a close look at that packet if you're thinking about that. There are um, official channels for posting internships. And in Molly's presentation, she mentioned the one for Vermont Tech. And so I'm going to skip ahead here and just show you. There are two main platforms in the state of Vermont for recruiting college interns. Um, there's one called Handshake. And those are the, the schools that use that one. And then College Central is the, the state of Vermont system. The nice thing is that you can post an internship in one of these and just check off the schools you want to recruit at. And so you don't have to make one of these postings for every single school. You can just broadcast it out to all of these different institutions. And they are set up so that they can recycle the same posting semester after semester so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time and you know think through like, oh, you know, what, what did I send to Sally at this institution six months ago? You can just log back in and repost this. And you can set this up so that um, students can send you their resume. You can choose to have them apply with a cover letter. You can choose to interview them. As the employers, it's up to you however you want to set this up. And it's up to you who you hire, how many people you hire, hours, things like that. That is your choice. Um, and uh, But there are questions to guide you in this platform about how to proceed. I think it's helpful just to, I mentioned before about checking in to set up um, like a halfway point check-in with the student intern and then a final check-in to say, um, you know, how have you been doing so far? What can you do to, to improve your, um, your work as well? I think the place where people run into trouble is when the student goes to do their final check-in and the employer goes, oh, well, I wish you would have done XYZ a little bit more or better or different. And at that point, you know, the student can't possibly succeed if they didn't understand what the expectations were. So having that halfway point is really crucial for them to understand what's going well, what could be improved. Kind of touched on this already, the importance of feedback. One thing I always think about too is um, just, just asking really intentional questions of student interns. I think people in this age group who are often between 18 to 22 years old, like some of them are going to be really ready for the workplace and for some of them it's going to be their first job. So if you see a student who, if you have an intern working for you who's really quiet, um, checking in like is, is this because you're usually a quiet person or are, are you bored or do you not understand what you're supposed to be doing or um, is something about this making you nervous and you need more of an explanation? Like just being sure to check in and ask is really important too. Ending this relationship is also helpful. You know, it, it, thinking about it is really um, important to be intentional here. So uh, 
helping to celebrate the students' accomplishments and thinking about, you know, can they help you recruit your next intern? Like, do they have any friends who might be interested in working for you as well? Offering to write them a reference for, you know, hopefully it's your organization, but even if it's not, keeping that relationship going. And the more you recruit interns and have these relationships on these different college campuses, the more the information proliferates about your organization. They're gonna know, like, this is a good place to work. My friend Joe interned there last year and had a great experience, or Sally got hired with them. So keeping that going is really helpful too. So I'm gonna hand it over, I think, to Virtual J. Is that right, Virtual for J. registered yes. apprenticeships? Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much, Amanda. All right, all right, last one here. I'm gonna go right to here. I'm gonna speed him up. All right, eight minutes. I'm Jay Ranty, an assistant director of workforce development at the Vermont Department of Labor, where I also serve as the state director of the Registered Apprenticeship Program. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I wanted to make sure you heard from me, so I'm coming to you by recording and here to give you a very high level overview of what registered apprenticeships are and what they can do for your business. So, what is RA or registered apprenticeship? Well, as you can see here, it's an industry driven or employer driven high quality career pathway where you, the employer, can develop and prepare your future workforce and where individuals or job seekers can obtain paid work experience, classroom instruction, and a portable nationally recognized credential. So simply put here, a paid job with education and credentials. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that it's a custom training and development tool for your workforce, for your industry, or your business. It's a formal training program that we also refer to as an earn and learn model. And it uh, also must meet the Vermont Department of Labor and the State Apprenticeship Council's registration standards. So the benefits to you as an employer in a registered apprenticeship program. Whoops, I'm sorry, folks. I'm not sure what exactly happened here. Uh, what? Sorry. Can you drag this whole thing? I think it's on a separate screen. You think it's on a separate screen? Yes, yeah, so if you go back to that. I'm just trying this for one second. I cannot believe so. There we go. Oh. Now I'm doing this sideways. Graham, you're also called a sponsor. It allows you to recruit and develop a diverse and highly skilled workforce. It allows you to improve profitability and it has a positive impact to your bottom line. It minimizes your cost with reduced turnover and liability. It allows you the opportunity to create a flexible training option that ensures your workers develop the right skills and in some cases don't have the bad habits that they might have learned from uh, other trainings that they've had or other positions that they've had. And uh, national studies suggest that 92% of apprentices continue employment after completing an apprenticeship. And finally, uh, it helps to foster a diverse and inclusive culture in your organization. You may be attracting people from different backgrounds because you're advertising that you're committing to training them for multiple years. And what I haven't said is this is a longer term uh, training strategy. It's not a short term uh, strategy. So what are the benefits to apprentices in case you're wondering about that? Well, it's this earn as they learn uh, model where they have a guaranteed wage increase as they develop new skills. Also, it allows them to receive an industry recognized and a nationally portable credential um, that can incorporate other credentials that you, the employer, want as the apprentice works through the program. It helps to ease the transition from school to career, or in some cases, uh, given our current labor market, a career switch. So people who are looking to learn a completely different uh, occupation or uh, switch career fields uh, by allowing them to work and learn at the same time. It also helps them gain workplace relevant skills in the field that they're choosing through the on-the-job learning. It can also help them get academic credit towards a college degree for the skills that they are learning while avoiding student debt. And finally, it helps them connect with experienced people in their chosen industry who can help them advance their career. And so I've taken um, a look at the Vermont Forest Economy Career Guide. It's an excellent resource uh, that is gonna be part of the discussion here. Um, but I pulled some occupations that were listed there and cross-referenced them. So these are some of the occupations that we can apprentice. 
these top four there, forestry teacher, arborist, bookkeeper, and carpenter, are all occupations that currently have registered apprenticeship programs associated with them or that are currently under development. Um, the logger and pesticide applicator and some of the other occupation samples on the right-hand column are other occupations that relate to the forest products industry. And there, there are many others, but this is just the sample. The numbers beside each one give a sense of how long it is expected to take someone to learn that particular occupation. And so they're stated in terms of hours, uh, 8,000 hours for a forestry teacher, uh, 4,000 hours for a logger. And the, the lowest ones there, the geospatial specialist and the truck and trailer truck driver take 2,000 hours, and that's a year. Uh, so 2,000 hours is a year, 4,000 is two years, and so on. So you get a sense of the, how long it can take to train someone in this uh, registered apprenticeship model. Um, so there are, these are the three elements of a registered apprenticeship program. And these elements are recorded in a document that we call Standards of Apprenticeship. And it details all the aspects of the apprenticeship program that your company wants to create and register with the Vermont Department of Labor. And this document addresses how you will recruit and select apprentices into the program, how the wage increases work, what the related instruction will be, and even how you would handle grievances from apprentices if they should have a problem in the program. The Standards of Apprenticeship is a document that you use to demonstrate compliance with the Department of Labor's Apprenticeship Program Registration Standards. The Standards document is what allows you to register the program and then to register your apprentices with us. On the previous slide, I showed you the average time and hours each occupation would take to learn through the structured on-the-job training. The structured on-the-job training is detailed in a document called the Work Process Schedule, and it is attached to the standards. It's essentially telling us how, uh, what all the uh, skills are that the apprentice needs to learn through the job and how many hours you've assigned uh, for that learning to take place. The next key element of the program is the support an apprentice receives from a mentor or supervisor. We require a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, that's for safety, and to ensure appropriate learning support and supervision while the person is learning the job. The last element of the program is related training and instruction. So this is classroom learning that covers the theory behind the practical learning that's happening on the job. And we require at least 144 hours of related instruction or classroom instruction for each 2,000 hours or for each year of the apprenticeship. So that works out to be about three hours a week, though it can be organized in many different ways, um, including upfront learning. Um, you can, so we're not bound by any particular set of rules for how that could be organized. It just has to be at least 144 hours for each year. And so again, as an employer, it's your program and you manage and maintain all aspects of the program from recruiting and hiring new apprentices all the way to their completion of the program. And once you notify us and certify that an apprentice has completed all the requirements outlined in your approved standards of apprenticeship, the Vermont Department of Labor issues a certificate of completion of registered apprenticeship to that apprentice. And I, a final note here, um, a registered apprenticeship is not a silver bullet it won't solve all of your recruiting or staffing problems. It is, however, a tool in your toolbox. It can help you to recruit people into your openings, and it can help you to develop and promote from within your workforce. If you advertise apprenticeship positions correctly, you're signaling to job seekers that you are willing to train them and guarantee wage increases as their skills increase. Registered apprenticeship is an attractive option to job seekers whether or not they went to college. Now, I'm gonna close here with um, my contact information or the contact information for the apprenticeship team here at the Department of Labor. We have a generic mailbox. You can send us an email and we'll get back in touch with you. You can also call my direct line. I may uh, direct one of my staff to respond to your inquiry, but just know that we're here. Um, this is a new area for many employers. The registered apprenticeship has a history in the construction trades. We're branching out into new areas. And so it's a lot to get your mind wrapped around. And I didn't want to try to take up a bunch of time in today to get into the weeds with it, but we're here to help you. Just reach out, let us know what you need. Thanks. Not bad, not bad. All right, just to finish this off, who's that? Oh, that's actually, uh, 
doubtful sound in uh, the southern island of New Zealand. Um, Amanda, I might need your help to figure out how to get back to this. Let's restart this slideshow. Oh, is that what that is? Oh, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Now we're backwards. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, we can just take okay. that off of that interview. <laughs> that works. Um, so, so this is a great opportunity for what are your questions, and then if we'll just take a, a little bit of questions and then we'll see if we can offer some ideas to the Vermont Woodworks Council uh, for what they could be doing to, to support and help all of you. So questions for any of the panelists. I, I, I guess we should not do Mo Molly <laughs> or Jay. So if there's questions for Jason or Amanda, let's, let's hear them. Go ahead, yeah. I think we saw I do the uh, game logging training and for most of the tech schools there for over 20 years. We're noticing what feels like a, I'm not sure if it's a question or comment, but and I'm on the board of staff at tech school on the panel here. And it just seems like all the schools are seeing less and less students, you know, tuition going down. And what I hear from the teachers is one that demographics are changing and we're just losing that population. But the other thing it seems like we're hearing is we're, we're seeing a lot of guidance counselors sending schools, discouraging the smart kids So it just seems like the quality of the student seems to be going down. I mean, not that we shouldn't be working with the kids on the job. It's a great opportunity for them. But I don't know, is there any way to work with these guidance counselors to educate them more to treat the these kids differently? I think uh, the education committees uh, have to change how CTE centers are, centers are funded, right? So every time a kid gets on a bus from high school, that money is following them to the tech center. And so with declining student populations, you know, it only takes so many students to get on that bus before they can't afford this math teacher. And another group of students gets on the bus also they can't afford this English teacher. So they're trying to, rightfully so, provide a, a really broad spectrum of opportunities for the, at the high school. So they're not just offering the free math classes because we only have one math teacher. Um, so high schools are in a bind because of the funding formula. Tech centers are seeing Maybe fewer students headed their way because of that. They'll say they don't, but right. there's some financial incentive to keep those students. But I think until the funding formula is changed, um, where it's not, where there's not a disincentive to send a kid to a, a tech center. Um, with the, I mean, in my region, Rochester's closed, Chelsea's closed, right? Like Bethel and Royalton have merged because of declining student populations. The schools are desperate to keep, or our towns are desperate to keep their, their local schools. So there's pressure on schools figure out how to keep kids at the high school, not the tech center. We've got to change the funding formula. So, yeah, so Representative Charlie Kimball, right back there, um, helped to write uh, what became S11 and has been very active on the CTE funding question for years. So Charlie, what can you say? It's a great question. Everyone knows it's a problem within education and in industry that the funding formula is broken. So in 2018, we passed legislation to say we didn't want to fix this. We want a study committee. And they finally did some work and delivered the report. I don't hope I don't offend anybody. But it came out in 2021 when it should have been done much earlier than that. So we have another study committee that's uh, now commissioned in this new legislation, S11, to ask for specific proposals to fix the funding formula. So it's, it's a controversy all the time because you're right some of the sending schools are nervous they're going to lose the ability to continue their programs not just AP classes but just regular programs if they lose those programs. Charlie do you have a sense of whether folks in the industry could be like how would they be tracking this because it seems like that study committee should really be hearing from employers about in terms of that this would be really helpful to have this fixed because of these issues because they're seeing it showing up that way. Yeah, I think the, uh, the organization is charged with soliciting RFPs is the Joint Fiscal Office and then in conjunction with the Agency of Education, but it also does rope in the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So it's all the different agencies working together in that sense. So it's, I know that they intend to talk to employers to figure it out. Um, and then the Department of Labor, we've asked them to stand up three new uh, pilot projects throughout the state to try to have more communication between 
the employers, career and technical education centers, and, uh, and the high schools and everything. So really to do that on a regional basis, it'll probably be St. Albans, Burlington, and Rutland, I think. But it uh, looks like that's what the pilot program is today. So uh, to be continued, mm -hmm. yeah. unfortunately, it is glacial pace. I mean, Charlie and, and others on the Commerce Committee have been working on this for years, and uh, it's been very frustrating. But we're, we're, we have a little bit more hope, given that what was in S11, that we've got some momentum. And I did hear, actually, Charlie, t correct me if I'm wrong, that this last year there was the highest level of participation in CTEs and from an enrollment standpoint across the state, much higher than in previous years. I mean, you. I just know that from visiting St. Albans, for instance, we've got 80 people in the construction pro uh, program. It's incredible, 80 kids, and they're doing some amazing programs there. Uh, but others are not so fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious. It was really impressive to see um, the amount of tech programs that exist across the state. And I'm wondering in terms of what, if there's some sort of umbrella organization or how those different tech programs um, CTE programs communicate amongst um, themselves if there's if that's through the agency event and just curious in terms of Jay leaving his role if there's somebody else who is occupying that space at the agency right now. Ruth Durkee um, is now in charge of CTE um, at the agency of education. So each within each center, there's what's called co-op coordinators, work-based learning coordinators, career development coordinators, whatever you want to title. But work-based learning coordinator is like the official title. So every tech center has a work-based learning coordinator. We meet um, every other month to work together, share opportunities, best practices, talk about who, what employers are looking, where industry trends are going. Um, but within which is each tech center, there's individual groups like us that meet at least every other month, if not once a month. Um, the school counselors, or the tech directors, and then we try. We did it this year, but then we try to have an all. Meeting, but also within tech centers, when you have um, so like all the construction trades and management instructors will meet throughout this throughout the school year as well at different times. So depending on what your industry is and what that need is, um, there's definitely different folks where you get that one contact person, they can expose you to every tech center um, throughout the state, which is I think that's what a lot of organizations want to do. But and I also want to put in a plug so every tech center is required to have the advisory board, right, for every program. And so that what that does is, if I'm in advanced manufacturing, I know what's happening in my local region with my manufacturers. I know what skills and training that those manufacturers are looking for, which might be different in Burlington compared to Bennington compared to Rutland. Um, I highly encourage folks to reach out to um, their program partners at the tech centers, volunteer to serve on their advisory boards. They only usually meet two or three times a year but it gives you a direct contact to program instructors um, to help shape, shape curriculum, help shape um, students of where they're heading next, right? Because we don't want to train students up for jobs that aren't there. So you can tell us these are where the jobs are going to be in this industry, so we're not heading them off in this direction. Um, so it's really important that we have those partners from industry serving on our advisory boards or advisory boards. All right, so um, I'm, I'd, I'd like to, to shift, if that's okay. Ed, do you have a Quick question. It was just about the advisory board. Okay. Is there a requirement that more than half of the members of that board be from the industry, from the employer? <coughs> That's a good or question. I'm not sure. Someone else might be able to. Like the way the model we have, we used to have. Sorry. Like the workforce professional board model we used to have required that 50 percent plus one be employer. I mean, it, potentially, I would would make sense, but I'm not sure exactly. As a co-op coordinator, or based on coordinator, I didn't have to have an advisory board. So I'm not sure the specifics around. Um, My only how it's, and it's anecdotal. Working with several different um, tech centers and their advisory boards, they're almost all employers. employers. But that's anecdotal. That it's not a requirement or specification. We can get that answer for you. All right. So in the 15 minutes we've got left here, um, Charlie or Kate, do you want to? I'm sorry. You, absolutely, please. Is Come on up. No, 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 please. I was going to yield the floor. So, um, 
I'm just a dumb furniture maker from Bridgewater, Vermont, who recently uh, had the luck to be um, elected the president of the Vermont Woodworks Council. And in one of the um, uh, things that uh, Kathleen Warner and a group of people did is they got a, a grant, a congressional grant, I can't exactly remember the name of it, but I think it might be up there, Congressional Directed Award for about 150000 um, and uh, the description of this is funding will support establishment of a workforce initiative designed to fill current and future employment needs in the wood products industry. These funds will support data collection that will be utilized to create a, a careers in wood website and collateral materials to support the development and implementation of a woodworking internship workforce development program that will fund 40 intern positions and engage 30 businesses in the woodworking industry. I just want to quickly say um, that, you know, as I started out saying, uh, I'm a furniture maker from Bridgewater. I uh, was a young person who uh, found my career and passion. Uh, I'm now 63 years old, and uh, my wife and I have a business that employs uh, about 20 people and quite a few young people. I am really interested to understand um, what is driving young people in their careers. And I know that the forest products industry is very attractive to people all over the country. So I know there's not a problem uh, in that department. So I'm hearing a huge amount of, inf luckily I came this, uh, these last two days, there is a huge amount of resources uh, available. And as the lady here in front pointed out, how are these things all connected? Um, and uh, I think, you know, I'm beginning to try to think out how are we going to use this money? Because it's one thing creating exactly what's stated on that piece of paper I just read to you. But I think we've got to go a lot deeper into see what are the driving forces that people are looking, what they want from work, from work, basically, and how it integrates with play and their home life. And I thought what Ellen presented yesterday on the board, which I need the slides from, the research that I think had been done by Indeed, did you say, uh, was hugely crucial that the landscape has changed. But I also, I think during COVID, the landscape has changed dramatically, whereas people are actually looking, they're seeing, A, that life is a, is a finite affair and that they want to choose things that they are happy doing, whether in, and secondary perhaps to the money part of it. I see a lot of workplaces and I know in our own workplace that people coming in have not necessarily been celebrated for their intelligence. And celebrating people's intelligence and their capabilities is something that they are looking for. And we see huge potential in our business for people who came in thinking that they had lacking in confidence fundamentally. And the whole trick was building their confidence to show them that they are highly capable people, maybe more capable than we can provide for, and they can move on to the next level. So having said all that, it looks like we will have to create, uh, and I'm working with Kate, who's our interim uh, direct, executive director, that we will have to create a board composed probably of six or 10 people from uh, the state involved in these matters uh, such as the people we met this morning. Uh, we haven't got the money yet. It's going to be next year's project, but we're going to need a lot of input. So, and obviously, given another five or ten minutes here, that is a completely impossible um, task. So, anyway, there's a lot of hugely interesting ideas. It's very difficult if you are just a financial maker from Bridgewater, Vermont, to suddenly leap from making a d table to suddenly trying to figure out like how do we put all this together and listening to a lot of complex leg legislative perhaps Charlie can pronounce that word legislative <laughs> formulas to all the sorts of rules and regulations there's a huge amount of complexity but I am interested in trying to make it simple and trying to pull some of these things together 
but I'm, I'm, I just happen to be the president of the Woodworks Council, and I have some, some say in how it's directed. But this, by me standing here and saying this, it puts a face on it, but also, hopefully, with the agreement of uh, our board, this is a little bit of a look at the direction we're aiming at. The resources are there, but I think we've also got to look into the psyche of the people looking for the jobs and how they're being treated. So if you were given 150000 to solve this problem, if anyone has a quick answer, I, I can write them down very quickly. So please put your hand up. If, you, if, there's, if this is your moment to say, please do not spend the money doing this, please spend the money doing this. And it better be about f three or four words. Probably in the next year and a half, if you get somebody from uh, acting as a representative from Vermont Woodworks Council with a lot of questions about what it is that you need um, for hiring and keeping a good pipeline of people, um, that that would be probably where this is coming from. Because with this grant, there's going to be a great deal of research so that we can put together some programs and resources um, for specifically our woodworkers and This is absolutely across the whole section. I mean, obviously, the Vermont Woodworks Council is supporting the, the uh, you know, more the finer products, you know, when they're refunding, making them small, the, the end products. Uh, but no, we represent all across the industry. So, yeah, there's no question about that. Yeah, that's where I sort of go back. I'm being selfish here. I represent the loggers. And if you don't have loggers, you're not going to have tables. We totally get it. It's <laughs> like, you know, that's like yeah. we don't have a lot of lives. Yeah, it's a sustainable forestry industry. All of them, all across the line. The sustainable forestry industry, just recently, about four years ago, got from the American Forest Foundation Project Learning Tree, which is a complete set of lessons from K 12 and beyond um, that introduces the forest to students, makes the forest a classroom, and it has tons of That's something that's going to go to help get that into our school. Yeah. And, and that's something that's ongoing, right? The forestry and the classroom project. I, yeah. think that's kind of that, you know? I think what we want to end up with, and what we don't want to do is blow a lot of money on administrative stuff, whether we are going to have to hire people to do the work, but we also want to end up with not necessarily specific programs into any particular areas, but some, some tools that can be used way into the future uh, to do with education in the forest products industry in the state of Vermont. So yes, right now we're all gasping for employees, you know, in three years time, it may be the very opposite. But at least we're going to create some tools that will get us through those slower, lower <coughs> moments. Um, so it's a long lasting product.
Are there any other underlying comments like regarding this program that they would like to be? I, I, think, I think I'm, I'm hoping that one of the takeaways from this is there's, there's an awful lot of good, high quality programs already out there. So I would just encourage you to not necessarily think about creating a new program, which then has to get funded year after year. But I think the Vermont Woodworks Council, um, it could really be dot connectors for the industry, meaning existing programs, but then it's how do you get the employers in all of the different trade associations that are members of those associations to know about that these programs exist. I mean, just having that communications flow and information sessions, or for instance, like I put up on here as an idea, I, I, only because I meant, I talked with um, Jay Ramsey about this in preparation. Uh, you know, what I was taking from hearing about the, the, the RA program is a lot of paperwork. So an individual employer having to do that all by themselves is going to like probably throw up their hands and say this is just too much. But what Jay said was one entity like the Woodworks Council could, could get trained in how to do it and then provide that service to 5, 10, 15 other employers and take care of that piece of it to make it easier on the employer to be able to accept a register apprentice and set up that program and just facilitate the process. So you're not having to create something brand new. It's you're really, really facilitating and being that connector entity that, that helps your, your folks get more up to speed on what already exists. Right. And I think it's as this lady here said about it. That was what yeah. she was, yeah. I think, we were yeah. trying to say. Yeah. And you pull this together. And hopefully it becomes a poster child for other industries in Vermont that it, it can be used as a way of, you know, obviously the Vermont Tech and all these organizations are covering all kinds of industries. Lisa? I'd love to build on what Ellen was just saying. In regards to the ones that choose the request, <clears throat> many of you are smaller. You have a need for two or three right now, a couple in another couple of years, two or three going on, and that is really hard for any of us to provide the right resource when you come as a one-on-one -on -one for us to think about how we support you. Organizations like BMEC or organizations um, as structures for Vermont Technical College or through all of the uh, CTEs are statewide. And when we commonly hear common threads bring us back into the councils like you're describing to see what those pictures are, it will address many of the, the concerns and challenges. What it does mean though, we heard this yesterday morning or early afternoon we had our opening, is we need to lean in. So there will be compromise. There will be some of you who have competitive positions. When those 10 opportunities, or then there's 20 opportunities and there's 10 participants, they're going to make choices and there's going to be compromise. And so we have to help figure out how to help each other and not abandon it when it didn't work the first time for each of us. Um, but we, you know, some of us have been around for a long time trying to do this, and this is an opportunity, this is a huge opportunity to have your voice heard, figure out the biggest challenges and then lean in to be willing to let it be successful for the whole and eventually you'll have your own personal success. Um, thank you. John Young and I work with probably 150 to 200 employers a year working on workforce development plans and I'm a huge believer we have a communication problem. That's what we have amongst all workforce, right? And the problem is a lot of state entities, colleges, high schools, bring a lot of information to websites, to employers, but the problem with the communication is it's only valuable if it's the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do in many sectors, and I think this would be great to do in this sector, is to have a one-point concierge center where an employer in that facility, they want to talk to Sue, they want to talk to Robin or Bob or somebody, that concierge can point them to a tech center, that concierge can point them to a state training grant that might be able to help them out. We have, we communicate, we have so many millions of ways to communicate today. Nobody knows what anybody's doing because everybody's got a website, right? So I really feel in all sectors, because I try to support all sectors across the state, if we can figure out some way to put sort of one big communicator per sector out there, to help, we just met, you knew nothing about my program, potentially you could use my program, maybe you could have used my program five years ago, potentially. Um, so it's really, there's so much information, so I think any sort
sort of concierge type support to an industry would be fantastic. I'm assuming that the fundamental question at that, to that point person is, I'm have a, having a problem finding and retaining employees. Can you help me? That will be the question to the phone operator, right, of this? Uh, or, or, or it could be a, a number of things, right? I, I, I need to get a hold of my representative because I don't like something's happening. So sort of that concierge that really, um, instead of somebody just complaining and, and not being happy with what's going on, a direction to go to um, to sort of maybe hit them up with a regional development center because there's permitting issues with their business, right? So just somebody that's going to be that generalist position um, that can field that and has an idea of the resources that are available across the state. Which is something that Christine McGowan already does a lot of in our shop, right? But in terms of a workforce-specific piece. Correct. That that is. And can start to hear more than one here repeated so that, that yes. consolidated people can come together to start solving that challenge. And many of you would if you knew three other sentences down. You should be able to have a cup of coffee and figure out some possible answers. I think being a basic employer, the question has to be really simple, like you've got to go to one. But my problem is, as business owners, there's so much incoming information. And just, you know, the last two days, it's just tons of organizations. And it's like you sort of need to be able to press and say, this is my problem, just like you said. Where can you get me? But we are focused on the workforce development. And we've got to remember that. Um, and maybe that person can direct them off to other areas. but. Hey, Mike, do you have any uh, final? Mike's been with us yeah, so a I, long I, time. Do you have any? I, I'm on the board, and <laughs> I, I'm just I, I'm concerned about staying on the rails here. Um, the some of the genesis of this was to aggregate what the what the training needs are for the industry and secondary industry because in primary, I mean, I, no no offense to anybody, but. There, there is forestry in the schools. There's building trades in the schools. There is no woodworking in most of the schools. Um, and when you do try to approach any of them, you, you hit a wall. And so what, what was in the, the, the Molly's program, you know, to aggregate multiple companies to, to, take, to, to do a C&C thing, that's what this wants to look at. Well, what is the aggregate need in the secondary industry for that kind of thing to be able to tie into a Vermont Tech program or something like that? And I think that's 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 where I thought this was going. And uh, you know, one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars is not a lot. You know? So we got to be real careful about it. You know, I don't want the, the, the entire industry to think we're going to do something like that because that's not. <laughs> well, you're on, you're on the board and we'll be having a board meeting, so that's where we're going to be starting.
but it's an exciting opportunity and you know in early days to figure out what is most needed and where those dollars can be most strategically utilized so stay tuned and thank you absolutely thank you all thank you all so much lunch is out there uh, in the tent in the sunshine and under the tent so please uh, thank you so much